We don't talk about when heroes kind of stumble or when heroes are feel vulnerable. And so there is, I think, this culture, um, even to date, within medicine, within healthcare providers, where you're kind of want to be tough and you don't want to express certain types of weakness. Let's quit talking about it like it's taboo. Let's right. talk about it like we all have it. That was Dr. Bernard Chang and Dr. Abby Beecham on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoengren, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Work Course. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Be sure to check out Praxis Continuing Education for their online trainings. Just go to the sponsors page of offtheclockpsych.com to link to Praxis, and there you'll find a discount code you can use for registration on any live training event. So check it out. We're also affiliates with Dr. Rick Hansen's online neurodharma program and his Foundations of Wellbeing programs. And you can find out more about them at our website, offtheclockpsych.com, where you'll get a $40 discount. Hi, this is Diana Hill here, and current times have really uh, inspired and motivated many of us to want to take committed action in our lives, make meaningful change that supports social justice, our health, our relationships, what we're doing in the world. And I am interested in helping you do that. So I'm going to be running a workshop on committed action, make meaningful change in your life that's online through Yoga Soup, which is my home yoga studio that's doing some great work in their own committed action towards social justice. This workshop is a sliding scale payment from $25 to $45. It's going to be held on Sunday, August 16th from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. online. It does offer continuing education for master's level uh, therapists and LPCs. And in the workshop, you'll get a chance to learn what committed action is, what it is not, how values are key in motivating change. And we'll use the matrix, which is a simple, quick, but powerful tool to support you in making value-based change in your life. So join me in on August 16th. You can sign up through my website, which is drdianahill.com, or you can sign up through Yoga Soup's website, which is yogasoup.com. I look forward to meeting you all there. Hi, this is Debbie. Last week, Jill gave us a terrific episode with Dr. Susan David on helping helpers. This week, we're going to talk about one specific group of helpers, healthcare professionals, physicians, nurses, different kinds of therapists, really anyone working in healthcare settings. And there are some unique issues and stressors that healthcare workers face. That was the case pre-COVID, and it's certainly the case now with everything that's going on with COVID. And for this episode, I have interviewed three experts on this topic, Dr. Bernard Chang, Dr. Abby Beecham, and Dr. Carrie Makinbird. And, and Abby, Carrie, and I, and a few other mental health professionals in Colorado are coming together to form a healthcare well-being collective. We have a webpage for folks who are looking for resources and support in this area. You can check it out. It's at healthcarewellbeingcollective.com. And if you're interested, you can link to it on our show notes for today. My hope is that today's episode will be of interest to healthcare professionals as well as mental health clinicians who work with healthcare professionals and really anyone who cares about this topic and who cares about supporting our healthcare workers. I think that supporting healthcare professionals is something that my three guests and I have all been working on in recent years, and it just feels even more important now with all the additional stressors related to COVID-19. So many people are under tremendous stress right now at work and at home, and it's really impacting people in terms of well-being, sometimes tragically so. So one of the things we talk about in the episode is provider burnout, which is a really common experience. And in part two of the episode, I talk about my own personal experience with burnout 
when I was working in a healthcare setting, Yael is here with me. Yael, I'm curious, what about you? Have you experienced professional burnout yourself in your work? Oh, yeah, definitely. I've long struggled with this repeated process of hitting my emotional and physical wall, recovering, only to do it again. <laughs> and um, I, I had actually written a couple of essays about this one published in Elephant Journal, Debbie, that I had shared with you. And I wrote it around the time that I was pregnant with my third child. So that was now about three and a half years ago. Um, so a long time before COVID. <laughs> um, but it kind of reminds me of what a lot of people, including myself, are, are feeling now. But I, you know, have been feeling so run down from caring for children, making a new one, maintaining professional responsibilities. And I noticed myself having this thought of how badly do I have to feel to take a day off? And I think in professional, it, when you're in healthcare, it is hard to feel like you can take a break because there are people counting on you. And certainly as a parent, people are counting on you. And so this sense that you just have to keep, as your guests talked about, white knuckling it through is really intense. And the problem with that is that most of us are, are human. So even if we want to keep persisting and doing the work that is so important for us, we burn out, we hit the wall and, and that creates problems for us. And then ultimately the people that we're caring for, because we can't functionally continue to do our jobs the way that we want to be doing them. And so it, it really is important for us to think about how we can support healthcare providers in doing the kind of work that is so important over the long run and not just sort of today or in this moment. And, and that's something that I've been thinking about for, for a number of years, but I, I do think as you're pointing out and that you're, you and your guests were pointing out in this episode, it is really critical to be thinking very deeply about what, what we can do to do better in this time and place because the stressors are so intense and it doesn't really look like it's, that's going to be going away anytime soon. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk recently about the culture of medicine and how the culture of medicine really needs to change. In fact, there was just an article that came out this week by Esther Chu. It's an opinion piece in the Washington Post called COVID-19 is pushing doctors to the brink. Medicine needs to recognize they're human and need help. It was a, an excellent article. I think there's this view that healthcare professionals should be invincible that they should just take on more and more and more and they can easily start to neglect caring for themselves. And I think this giving people the sense that they should be able to handle it all, it becomes really hard to admit when it's too much. A metaphor I sometimes use with my clients is, you know how you see a duck gliding across the water and it looks all smooth, but underneath it's, it's little duck feet are paddling frantically. I think people get more and more stressed and it just feels like they're paddling harder and harder and harder, but they feel like they have to look smooth on the surface. And it's like, how hard can you paddle? At some point, it's too much. And then this pressure to look smooth on the surface, it's like you can't show it. And I think one thing I've seen too recently, we talk, I talk about this with Dr. Chang in the episode, is right now there's these narratives that healthcare workers are superheroes. And we all appreciate what they're doing for all of us right now. But I think that superhero narrative, it even adds more to that sense that they should be invincible. Yeah, it's kind of a setup. What I love just on the superhero topic is, you know, in Jill Stoddard's recent episode on extending compassion, she talked about this kind of therapy called superhero therapy. So Dr. Janina Scarlett, one of her guests, um, talked about how she incorporates superhero characters and ideas into therapy. But rather than defaulting to this narrative of superheroes are invincible, she actually talks about how superheroes, even in the stories, are actually not invulnerable. In fact, what connects us to those stories, makes us cheer for those superheroes, is the way that they confront their vulnerability. So it isn't the absence of vulnerabilities that makes someone strong. It's how we relate to and use our vulnerabilities, how we grow from them, how we allow those vulnerabilities to lead us into action, whether it's into recharging our bodies and spirits or growing resilience or new skill sets or growing compassion for ourselves and others. That's really what creates the power of superheroes. And so I loved that episode and I, I love how in your conversation with your guests today, you really talk about the importance of recognizing that the people that are offering 
this healthcare that we so value, that we really admire, that they're not superheroes and that, that doesn't make them weak. And that, that actually is something that we can look up to even more. That's right. I think there's, there's a lot to learn by, from clinical psychology, by medicine that might actually be helpful and, and ultimately save lives. Because if we can help promote well-being and acknowledge people when it is too much, I think that people are more likely to get the support that they need. So today we have a two-part episode. First, we're going to talk about the problem, some of the issues that are going on here. And then in part two, in part two, we'll talk a bit more about what we can do to promote healthcare provider well-being. I'm going to start my interview with a segment I recorded with Dr. Bernard Chang. Dr. Chang is an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Columbia University. He's a practicing emergency physician and a research psychologist who studies the cardiovascular impact of stress on healthcare clinicians. So we're going to hear a little bit about his work, and then also midway through the episode, we'll hear more from him about what it's like specifically to be in the emergency room in New York during COVID-19. Welcome, Bernard. Hi, Debbie. It's great to see you. Dr. Great to Sorry. see you too, Dr. Chang. We, we joke because we went to graduate school together. Back in the day, we both got our PhDs in psychology together at Harvard. So we're reunited. So really grateful to have you here because I think you know better than anybody what's going on with provider stress right now. So Bernard, after finishing your PhD in psychology, you out overachievered the rest of us by going to get your MD at Stanford. What values were behind your decision to choose to go into medicine? So first of all, thanks so much for having me on here. I really am excited to kind of just talk with your audience and just chat with everybody for a few minutes. Um, I, aside from being wanting to be like a lifetime student, I think for me, the main motivation for going to medical school was I did most of my research as a psychologist looking at schizophrenia and some of the more biological basis for disease. And what really touched me was looking at um, kind of when I was doing some of my research kind of on the hospital wards, watching some of the clinicians, um, seeing the clinical psychologists and the physicians really at the bedside, really impacting patients directly. And it really got me excited about that. And I thought, wow, as much as I love research, I think having that direct patient-patient contact was just so profoundly like meaningful, um, watching it from afar that, you know, even though I knew it was going to take me a couple more years and a long route, I thought it was ultimately worth it to really be able to have that chance. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I asked that, that question for a reason, which is that I think people usually go into healthcare, into medicine, because they care, there's something they care about in there, and there's something really important and and meaning driven, mission driven about this work. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that kind of underlies, I think, a lot of what we see with the impact of providers on yeah, no. stressful work. No, I agree, and I think one of the most challenging things in some ways is because. I would say that the majority of, of folks who go into medicine or go into healthcare really are driven by some uh, very positive sense of they want to have some type of positive impact on patients. And I think the really um, sad thing is, is seeing kind of like the psychological toll on providers and seeing themselves really affected or impacted by both the occupational stresses or kind of working in the system that ultimately um, the, that mission for trying to help people gets uh, confounded or gets uh, almost blurred with this sense of emotional exhaustion too. So I think it's, it, it's an incredibly sad, incredibly alarming um, phenomenon that we see among healthcare providers who kind of go in really with the best of intentions. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about what, you're, what we're seeing? Like what do we know about basically the rates of things like burnout, depression, even suicide within healthcare providers and physicians? Yeah, so it's a really, so I don't want everything, all this to be bleak and scary, but I think just kind of starting out with some um, statistics probably might be help frame kind of the conversation from here. So looking at uh, rates of burnout or occupational stress, so the way we describe burnout is really more this psychological exhaustion or emotional exhaustion from um, that you're attributing to your work environment. Um, I know there's different terms for burnout, different ways of operationalizing it, but thinking about burnout like that, we see rates of burnout in healthcare providers, both physicians and nurses and other um, healthcare providers at significantly higher rates compared to other um, professional jobs. So 
For example, within the House of Medicine, uh, acute care providers, emergency physicians, physicians report almost 60% uh, of rates of burnout. Um, and that's extraordinarily high. But then you frame that in the context of the, all medical specialties, um, almost 50% of providers report symptoms of burnout. I think this is very, very concerning that uh, we see it early on, too, that uh, residents, like the house staff or the trainees, the folks who have just recently graduated from medical school, their rates of burnout are also similarly very high, too. And so I think that this is a phenomenon that we're seeing that um, is both um, kind of pervasive within medicine, but then also starts early. Um, I think from the standpoint of, of suicide, I think, again, it's really you know, one of the, 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 the most tragic outcome um, from psychological stress that we're seeing uh, among our healthcare providers, uh, we see about two to three hundred deaths by suicide um, by healthcare professionals each year, and uh, physicians unfortunately have significantly higher uh, rates of death by suicide compared to other peer uh, professionals. Um, when you look at the data within that, um, women physicians in particular have almost one hundred forty percent chance of, of dying by suicide uh, compared to peer uh, professional. Um, uh, women. And you see also a similar um, number with men at almost a uh, 40% higher rate of uh, death by suicide. So I think the, the numbers are scary in the sense that I think the healthcare professionals are really vulnerable to burnout and that there are severe consequences um, to this uh, phenomenon we're seeing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's more to know about so that people can reach out and get whatever support that they need. Um, okay. Yeah. So what you mentioned earlier, some stressors that play a role in this and that contribute to burnout, depression, et cetera. Can you talk a bit about some of the stressors that might be at play here specific to this profession? Yeah. So I think that taking and tackling apart burnout, you want to kind of conceptualize by a couple of different levels of analysis. So there are a lot of like what I would call individual factors, you know, irrespective of the occupational health risks or stresses of medicine, um, such as individuals with their either individual stresses but at home or um, a pre-existing history of mental health um, uh, problems. But I think that um, what we're talking about today really is the occupational stresses. And so the House of Medicine is a really unique um, endeavor operation. Uh, you have uh, folks who are working usually nonstop um, at a dis uh, a dysregulated working schedule where they're sometimes working days or nights. Um, their sleep schedules are all off keel. Um, they're also being exposed to uh, extraordinary levels of stress, not just from um, the, like their sleep cycles, but also from the things that they're seeing at work, um, particularly among folks working in, say, the ICU or um, the emergency department, but then also even in the outpatient clinics. They're seeing folks coming in, their patients coming in, sometimes the most vulnerable levels points in their lives and telling them really um, tragic stories at times. And I think you can imagine that this can have some psychological stress also on the providers who are listening and trying to help these individuals. Um, and then lastly, we're also seeing now this age, this digital age of uh, electronic health records and documentation. There's just clinicians are encountering tremendous amounts of documentation burden. That's what oftentimes colleagues will call it, where they're spending a lot of time in front of the computer rather than in front of the patient, uh, really just kind of doing kind of those check marks. And I think that whole combination of stresses really can lead to some psychological distress from among different providers. Yeah, it's a lot to manage. Certainly, it's just a heavy burden and, and a lot of stress that's sort of chronic over time. Um, now, there's also the issue of, I think, stigma within medicine. And I think that to me, there's, there's almost this view that, that it's not talked about that much. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point. And uh, we talked about this earlier before the recording about, um, I would say that here in New York, at least during the pandemic, we've been having these seven o'clock um, healthcare or essential worker collapse where people are Essentially, I mean, it's really touching uh, speaking as a healthcare provider. People are clapping. You feel like kind of like a hero um, doing this. But the, what I, I say is like the kind of unhealthy flip side of that, the, the, the other end to that is that we don't talk about when heroes kind of stumble or where heroes are, feel vulnerable. And so there is, I think, this 
culture, uh, even to date within medicine and within healthcare providers, where you're kind of want to be tough and you don't want to express certain types of weakness. And so I think there's really uh, an under, uh, underestimate, underestimate of uh, mental health um, stressors occurring within providers that um, we're not seeing in uh, the literature today. And so we might be underreporting the number of stressors that people are feeling, as well as folks who are just who probably would benefit from help or just not seeking help. Well, this is where I really feel like the solution is we were saying earlier, Bernard, is for our two worlds to come together because I do think that clinical psychology and other mental health professions have something to offer here in terms of normalizing those emotions that people are feeling and just normalizing that even heroes aren't immune from going through a tough time. In fact, that's what makes them courageous, right? It's just uh, being able to, to face their vulnerabilities and their own emotions. And so I think, yeah, if, maybe if people can learn more about this and, and kind of have the sense that it's normal to feel like this is hard and to go through burnout at times, it's what you do with it, it might be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think that... Um... You know, speaking as a psychologist, I mean, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but as a research psychologist and as a as a physician, I, I really have come. You know, I have a tremendous amount of admiration for um, clinical psychologists, both in terms of their content expertise, but also the way that they try to kind of unpack some of the complexities of human distress and anxiety and depression, and how to kind of like approach that in a way to kind of improve outcomes. And I think. I've always talked to like my physician colleagues who don't know that much about behavioral health or psychology is that um, a lot of the interventions or the ways that uh, clinical psychologists approach um, these challenges are in many ways similar also to our, our, our sisters and brothers in medicine too, in allopathic medicine, in that um, we really try to break down the, the chief complaints into kind of digestible smaller parts and really kind of unpack what's really kind of driving the root cause of it. And I think, you know, having a recognition of that our stresses or what we're feeling as providers is something that uh, can be explored and can't even be unpacked, and, you know, with the help of some professionals is something that is like very encouraging, I think. Yes. And there are, are skills and, um, you know, ways that you can get some help. Tell us a little bit about your research. You research the health impact of stress on providers. What are you finding in, I know that this is a bit of a nutshell because it's probably complex, but what, what are you learning from your research? Yeah, so uh, we, we, what we look at is um, essentially working in the emergency department, I've, I look at the impact of the acute care environment on both patients and providers. So what we've looked at before um, was the impact of, say, emergency department crowding and length of stay, et cetera, and how does that impact um, the development of acute stress in stroke patients and people who have had a heart attack. And so we've looked at those folks in like a small time capsule, like, you know, one emergency department visit. And so I, I, I was really curious. I was like, well, what about the providers, the nurses, the docs, the, the, the transporters, the folks who are in the, the hospital setting, not just for like one day, but for like years on end, does like that um, that does that environment really um, impact people's psychological uh, well-being? And now, speaking as a health psych- as a health psychologist, does that impact their cardiovascular or autonomic nervous system? And so, what we've been finding is that, um, lo and behold, uh, it does. Uh, that um, when you're having uh, high periods of uh, acuity in the emergency department or crowding, not only are you seeing increases in providers' subjective sense of distress, but you're also seeing elevated resting blood pressure. And what's interesting about that is that that blood pressure, the time for it to kind of return back to like normal is quite long. And so um, cardio, from looking at it from a heart standpoint, um, high blood pressure is a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. So one of the fears that I have is that, you know, prolonged exposure, prolonged stress to this could also actually not be just harmful for your psychological health, but to your cardiovascular health. So again, we'll hear more from Dr. Chang later in the episode about his experience in the emergency department in New York during COVID-19. But now I'm going to move into my interview with doctors Abby Beecham and Carrie Makenbird. All three of us are psychologists with expertise in working with healthcare professionals. Abby, can you start us out by telling us a little bit about yourself and your experience in this area? 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, right now, I am the director of behavioral science at the University of Louisville School of Dentistry, uh, which is an unusual position. Uh, but my area of work pertaining to what we're talking about today is really around provider well-being. And uh, for the past three or so years prior to coming to the School of Dentistry here in Louisville, Kentucky, I was at University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I was working as a, a resilience psychologist. It, and and I, that really is not a thing, uh, but that was my title. Uh, I developed programming uh, for providers that really was designed to enhance well-being and um, buffer against burnout. But the other things that I did was I, I did a lot of uh, confidential consultation, you can think of it as triage, helping providers get to um, mental health services or whatever kinds of programming or services and support they felt they ne needed. Um, my research in this area is very new. I'm actually a health psychologist, but um, have been doing some research on our programming, uh, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but um, really, really interested in broadening this area and, and you know, conversations the last few months with Debbie and others, you know, there's such a need um, to do better in this area. And so that's, that's my background and that's what I'm doing now. Thank you, Abby. And Carrie, tell us about yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Makenbird. I'm a clinical psychologist and executive coach. And right now I'm in private practice in Denver, Colorado. And before that, I was a special matter expert on trauma within the Veterans Health Administration. And I um, had the opportunity to train hundreds of providers on self-care, resilience, trauma-sensitive responding, especially within the high pressure, high, low time, high demands of their positions. So I'm thrilled to be here. And um, on a personal note, when I was a clinician in at the University of California, San Francisco, I had a personal experience with vicarious trauma as well. And it got me very interested kind of early in my career on how do we do mission-driven work that is pulls for much of our values as well as our heart and how do we create a sustaining way to do that so i feel fortunate that i had that experience early and then was able to spend about a decade um, doing my own exploration as there was this emerging science around um, compassion mindfulness acceptance and how we can really fuel ourselves for the work that is deeply meaningful to us Great. Thank you, Carrie. Glad you're here. Yeah. Podcast listeners know who I am. I'm Debbie Sorensen. I'm a psychologist in private practice in Denver. I am also really interested in this area, partly because I spent 12 years working in a healthcare setting as a psychologist on an interdisciplinary medical team. So I was in there with physicians, nurses, physical therapists, you name it. And as part of that team, I experienced some of the challenges of being a healthcare provider myself. And I also worked with a lot of teammates who went through some stress, some burnout, just some of the challenges of working in a system like that. And so now healthcare provider well-being is one of my areas of specialty in my private practice and something I really enjoy doing. And I feel like I've been on both sides, the personal side and also the, the side of being a provider helping with this issue. So that's where I'm coming from. And I'm hoping we're going to have a three-way conversation about this today. So Abby, there's been a lot of research in recent years well before COVID-19 happened about health care provider stress, burnout, mental health issues. Um, it's even been called a public health crisis. It's that bad. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you've been working in this area. Can you just give us a sense of, of what's been going on and what research tells us about this? We first became aware of burnout and physician and provider well-being and burnout on the heels of coverage of um, physician suicide and specifically medical resident suicide. And so the the bodies that govern medical education said you need to do something about well-being for medical residents and 
you know, those things often drive more research. And they started looking at what can we do to help our residents? What can we do to help students? And the individual impetus of we need help as individuals actually led to more focus at the, on the system. And there are a lot of people who feel that if we don't, and this is rightly so, very accurately, if we don't fix our system, then there's nothing we can do on an individual level to help make people more resilient to a system that is essentially killing them. Now, um, here's, where, here's where the rub is. In the research and in the programming, some people feel like if we continue to offer individual support and individual programming, that's actually sort of insulting to the providers themselves saying, hey, it's your fault. All you have to do is meditate. All you have to do is do yoga. And there is a stress about, you know, system level kinds of focus areas, team within healthcare teams, and with the individual. And so some people are saying, stop with the individual and focus on the system. And other people are saying, yes, and we need to do all these levels. And so um, there's some significant research out of Mayo, Stanford, uh, and then other individual programming kinds of initiatives. Um, I think we'll see a lot more on mindfulness acceptance um, and positive psychology emerge for individual and team-based intervention. So um, the research is coming of age, and people are having a lot of discussions, um, spirited, we call them spirited discussions, about how we facilitate meaningful research and make change in the area. Yes, I, and I, I'm so glad that you acknowledge the system level of this because I think that is absolutely key. Otherwise, we're into blame the victim territory here, right? Mm-hmm. What, do you, what do we see in terms of the mental health impact on providers? Like, how is this looking? Well, I think there are two lenses through which we have to view the mental health impact on providers. The first is that um, I don't know if the data that we have is really um, reliable because we have to point to the fact that if you're a provider and and you seek mental health services and have a a psychiatric diagnosis, in some states you have to report that to your licensure board. And so there is this hesitance to present for treatment, endorse symptoms, and then follow through on getting treatment. The other thing we need to um, key in on is that uh, many times when providers do seek mental health treatment, they're required to do so by another entity. So it almost becomes pejorative. And so let's just assume the base rates of what's reported are low. Let's also assume that the base rates of providers who uh, are experiencing anxiety um, extraordinary fatigue, what we refer to as burnout, and other, you know, mental health symptoms are far higher than the base rates in the general population. And that the people we see anecdotally, and I think we can each talk to this, is that uh, there is a whole lot of suffering. And there is this strain around, I can't let people know that I'm suffering. It's a vulnerability that I'm not allowed to have either in how I regard myself or how others regard me. And so we know there's a demand We also know that many people would like to be seen outside the system in which they work. And so as COVID-19 emerged, systems were offering programming. And many times those systems are keeping notes in the same electronic health record as everybody else in their system. And so there's a need outside the organization to allow providers to be seen uh, and be able to speak openly and honestly about their experiences. And there's a lot we just don't know. Dovetailing on that, I, I think that that's really important. Can we talk a bit more about the culture of medicine and how stigma, team dynamics, just the basically what you've seen in your work on in terms of the social context of what's going on here? Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah. You know, um, there is that old saying, physician heal thyself. <laughs> and, and really... Uh, I think that extends to mental health concerns as well. And that, that we would like to think that we have evolved to a point as a society that there is not a stigma attached to seeking support, 
acknowledging our, our human, uh, our humanness, our common humanity, and um, that we need help. But uh, the stigma is alive and well in uh, the medical setting. Our data uh, from some of the program we did at, at University of Colorado suggests that, and I think this is supported elsewhere, that when physicians and other providers have um, bad outcomes, uh, some kind of stressor uh, in their work situation, the person they most prefer to speak with is not a counselor or a therapist. It is a trusted um, peer. And so what we know is that people don't want to be pathologized. And I think that's true for everybody. They don't want to be pathologized. Um, and, and so I think have, as we work, to meet their needs, coming at this from a less pathological way of labeling uh, is going to be really important. Um, So the stigma is alive and well and resistance is alive and well. Once you admit, I think others judge you and it it can be discipline specific too. So surgery might view things a little differently than say family medicine. So we see that as well. Yeah, I mean, that that really speaks, I think, to the importance of the team, right? So if you're on a supportive team or even have a few handful of colleagues that you feel will support you and that are going to be able to talk about these things, it makes a huge difference. And I don't think that's always the case on in every department or, or every team. There's a lot of that is variation That is absolutely there. true. That's absolutely true. When teams start to speak the same language, and begin to share ways of working together uh, to support the well-being of the individuals on the team and offer different kinds of social support, um, then that team can thrive. Uh, Some teams are just, you know, a team on paper, um, but the experience is really aversive for the members of the team. And we see that a lot. Yeah. When we see the suffering emerge, sometimes it is so entrenched and held for so long that it actually is much, it is just a, it's a longer process to kind of unlearn some of the white knuckle coping as opposed to, you know, if this was perceived as a prevention, you know, a preventative science and a kind of, um, oh, new data says we need nine waters, nine glasses of water as opposed to eight. There would be a little more like, let's tune up as we all drift, as opposed to, oh, you're either perfectly healthy or perfectly on, you know, burnout, crispy. Um, yeah, but that's a really good point. So once we, once people are pretty far down that road, it's harder to make substantial changes. Yeah, I think it, at least in my, I mean, just thinking about my clinical experience, it's just, you know, it's a longer, depending on how deeply you've kind of embedded yourself in the hole, it sometimes can just take a little bit longer to pull out because you're tired. That's a really good point. And, and for many of the uh, physicians in particular, they want the quick, the silver bullet, the quick hit. Absolutely. You know, just give me some. Yeah. Give me the um, exercise. Give me some. Just give and, me the breathing and, exercise. Yeah. Check, check. Yeah. And, and just give me something so that I won't feel the way I feel. And then we'll do that. Yeah. Oh, you know, like yes. the email I would get, we have 15 minutes to talk about resilience. Can you come present? And then we'll do it. And then can you come another day and talk about work-life balance? And then we'll do it. You're right. like, you know. If it was that simple, I would also love to integrate that's that. That's right. <laughs> I'd be I'd be doing it. Right. <laughs> totally. exactly. Yeah, this is systemic and it's been going on for years, but we want the 15 minute fix and that's mm-hmm. not that's just not how well, it, it works. It makes sense. Yeah. Oh. If yeah. they weren't well defended, they wouldn't have survived their training. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? 
So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl Meal Mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. So there's a really influential article that came out let me see, 2018 by uh, Simon Talbot and Wendy Dean, which is called Physicians Aren't Burning Out, They're Suffering from Moral Injury. And there have been a series of articles since then on this topic, but it really changed the conversation. So what they're writing about here is moral injury, which is when you did something that feels morally wrong. And they argue that healthcare providers, physicians, they write about physicians, but I think this is true beyond physicians, but that they have a sense of what is good practice, what's good for their patients, what's good medicine, but they work in systems where often they are unable to provide that level of care. And so they end up with this feeling of, you know, I didn't do the right thing. I didn't do the best thing. And that that actually may be the source of some of what we see with what we tend to label as provider burnout. And again, I think it's to Abby's point earlier that, uh, you know, you can say this is a burned out provider and there's a sense of blame the victim in that because in fact, it's really what we're seeing is a natural result of the systems that people are in. For those who may not be in the healthcare field, some of the things that you see are just the high level of admin work that people can't possibly keep up with, the pressure to see as many patients as possible. There's I, I've heard from a number of providers, and I, I remember feeling this way myself in my, on my medical team, that the actual patient work is great. I love it. I could do it all day long. Sure, it's hard sometimes, but it's you get bogged down by the million emails a day trying to keep up with the electronic health records, um, all these extra trainings and paperwork that you just keep piling up, piling up, piling up. And it's, yeah, it's a, it is a recipe for burnout. I think you hit hit a really important point. Um, The measurement of burnout, (laughs) it's like, what are we really measuring here? Um, And, and is it really a thing as opposed to a very fluid experience? And the people know it (laughs) and and we can talk about the measurement, but it is, it is true. Less, Less pertinent is the measurement per se, as the way people regard it. And they do regard it as, oh, well, you know, someone's else burned out. That's it for them. But the reality is we all have it. We all have it. And it's fluid. And so we created this graphic, this graphic of a highway with regular rest areas that have a scenic overlook (laughs) where, oh, I noticed this. I'm going to take a look at it and then get back on the highway as opposed to the final destination because they do talk about it. Well, I think I'm burned out. That's the end. I think that's really important for people to wrap their heads around that this is an experience that every single person has who works in this field and that it will ebb and flow like emotions ebb and flow. And, you know, everybody is going to have it. If we just assume that everybody's going to have it and then we work with it, what you just talked about earlier, Carrie, is this ingrained 
approach to the white knuckling of not noticing and checking in. That's where we run into the difficulty. That's very consistent with the acceptance and commitment therapy model, right? That we all have these feelings at times. We all have these moments where we feel stressed, where we feel burnt out. It's only when it impacts our ability to do the things we care about or when we're ignoring it and just digs us in deeper over time that it gets to be a big problem for people. But I think that's really true. I mean, most people in high stress jobs that they care about will sometimes go through that. Mm -hmm. Well, you just did a segment on parenting. I know parental burnout. You can... parental burnout. You know, and let's just, we have them both at once, right? Let's quit talking about it like it's taboo. Let's right. talk about it like we all have it. So all this is going on, and now it's 2020. So enter COVID nineteen, and now we're going to hear from Dr. Bernard Cheng again about his research related to what's happening with COVID nineteen for healthcare professionals. And we're going to hear a bit about his experience working in emergency medicine in New York. From a COVID standpoint, we've done some surveys now of uh, the healthcare workers here locally at my institution at Columbia. And we found in a study of about 650 um, healthcare workers that the rates of acute stress are really high. You know, we're talking about 60% um, right now compared to. Uh, usually with acute stress in our previous samples, we see rates of, you know, maybe like 5%, if that, among some of the acute care workers, but we're seeing, you know, extraordinary numbers from there. We're also seeing about 40% of our providers of that sample that we looked at having really bad insomnia or bad sleeping. And so we're finding that this this event is really a, impacting not just um, your your mental well health, but also kind of like your somatic and your physical health as well. Wow. Yeah. So it's high rates of how this is, is affecting people in the af- the immediate aftermath. And I know you're right there in New York, which has been, you know, a huge outbreak here in the U.S. Can you tell us just, you know, the, the numbers support this? What are you seeing around you just anecdotally um, as you go through this over time? Yeah, no. So it's really been surreal here um, in New York. Um, I think now I would say just thank goodness over the last few weeks, um, it's been a little bit more common in the emergency department and just around, but I think I would say taking us back about six to eight weeks ago, it was really just something, I, you know, I've been quite honestly, was really unprepared for. Um, I've done some work kind of uh, outside of the United States, kind of working clinically, and it, it was a really surreal moment, I would say, about eight weeks ago where I felt like, you know what, I'm, I feel like I'm working in a disaster situation, but it's actually home. And I really kind of like, um, I like, resonated um, with me and kind of like really shook me. I think one of the challenges here that we've been seeing was, I think kind of a, what I say like disaster medicine responses that um, on one level were just extraordinarily stressful seeing people that were previously young and healthy, dying um, people, you know, that the rate of people coming into the emergency department so quick that you really couldn't, couldn't keep up, Um, you know, critical supplies that, we were, we've kind of taken for granted, really, you know, like an oxygen mask or uh, a mask to protect yourself um, that you all of a sudden were thinking about, well, we've only got five left. What are you going to do with that? So I think, you know, some of those things were really just extraordinarily stressful. But I think probably for a lot of the other clinicians, too, what was also really stressful was I never, I never, whenever I come into work, even now, like, you know, there's always a risk coming into the emergency department that something might happen that, you know, um, you, you might have, there was, there was some degree of harm to yourself, but I truly, in, in the height of the local um, peak here in New York, I really, every time I went to work, I really was scared that I would get really, really ill and really sick. And I think that fear of not just getting sick yourself, but also fear of bringing it home to your family was something that really was scary, not just um, for myself, but I think for a lot of my colleagues. And I think we saw, you know, lots of my friends lived separate from their families during this period, and they had, they weren't able to see a lot of their friends and families, and some of their families got sick too. And I think that that whole situation of something like what work really was, so you were surrounded by all of this, um, that really, I would say, really impacted all providers, not just all providers, but all individuals living around this area during this time, like in a really profound way. Absolutely. You know, I was, I changed jobs at the VA here in Denver, but I was going into the hospital right 
when the pandemic happened is around the time I, right when it, everything started to shut down was right around the time I was winding up there. And it's just hard to describe what it's like in those moments to just even go to work. It really gets your threat system going, your fight or flight system is activated. Um, and there's so much uncertainty. I think it's a really heavy emotional toll. Um, Bernard, thank you for the work that you're doing and for, you know, being one of those people who shows up in this stressful situation for the benefit of all of us. I, I'm not trying to make you a hero here, but I do want to say that for you and everybody else who's listening, just, I'm so appreciative. No, thank you, Debbie. And I think also thank you to, to your team as well, too, for giving me a chance to like chat with um, your listeners. And I'd also say too that uh, I think with the type of work you're doing, this kind of this outreach is just absolutely critical. I think the more that we spend time talking about this and destigmatizing something like this, I think the better it can be for our healthcare workforce um, and just a general community. I always say that a healthy doctor, a healthy patient, um, that we really want to take care of the well-being of our healthcare providers because I think they really are like the bedrock for our community. And I think we really just need to like kind of focus on taking care of like the providers out there out there. So thank you to everyone else, all the listeners too, as well for kind of fighting a good fight. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Thanks. Now we have a high degree of stress and trauma in healthcare. We've seen stories of high profile physician suicides in the news. We know the number of stress and losses that that healthcare providers are facing around the world. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing, what the impact might be of this on providers over time. I think it's worth noting that there's a huge variation, right, in the, what healthcare providers are experiencing. I think we think of the ones that are right there on the front lines, like in the ICU with patients with COVID. But I think physicians and providers who are in other areas are also impacted, whether it's furloughs or their clients going through a hard time with this. There's just so many levels on which this is impacting the healthcare system mm-hmm. and providers. Now there's almost this sense that people are just in this kind of urgent phase or have been at least the last few months. And so I want to turn to Carrie and just see what you're seeing. You're a trauma expert here. What are you seeing in terms of these stressors and how how this might impact providers, Carrie? Yeah. Um, Deb, to continue on your point, uh, I think there are both go, my expectation is there will be both short-term and long-term impacts, especially as we kind of walk through the first wave. What I hear and observe across that, as you just said, is reflected in the research and I'm kind of um, perceiving across the circles that I swim in is a lot there's a lot of white knuckling. There is a lot of, we are in this sprint. There is um, sometimes a perspective of, this is what we practiced for. This is why we did the work we did. Um, Also a lack of sleep, a feeling of being pulled in a thousand directions, both in personal life and in their roles as caretakers and parents and spouses or partners, as well as their professional roles. Um, Sometimes providers being asked to do things they haven't done since medical school, right? As everybody is being asked to kind of diversify and shift. Um, When they are off, um, much higher rates of um, numbing out, um, sometimes substance use, um, which my guess is, is this is not just simply medical professionals that we're seeing this in the general population as well. Um, this kind of vacillation, I mean, with all overwhelming events, it is a normative process for us to, um, notice changes in sleeping and eating, changes in um, dreams or ability to stay asleep, changes in our behavior, emotion regulation. Um, and what I would just kind of plant a seed for is if people are noticing that, so some of those changes are, all of those changes are very normal in the short term. And 
if an overwhelming event was limited, time limited, we would expect that the majority of people across four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks would slowly return to kind of pre-overwhelming event, event functioning. Now, of course, COVID-19 is not a time-limited event. This is something, I mean, you know, in, in the history of time, it is time-limited, but in the brief um, years that we each have on this planet, this may take up a chunk of our years. Um, and what I would say aloud to medical professionals out there is if you notice that the, some of these effects, a difficulty with sleeping, uh, real changes in eating, um, significant impacts on your relationships and support systems. Um, if you are noticing these things and they're not evolving, um, or if it feels like they're actually getting worse, then this is now is the time to start thinking about how you care for yourself. Um, we are all in a marathon right now, and none of us would argue that you don't take water from the water stops because that makes you fill in the blank, um, weak, not as good as, you know, the next doctor, um, we see hydrating ourselves on a marathon or endurance race as key and necessary. And I would argue, and there's lots of data to support that, that hydrating our minds and our hearts through rest, connection with others, clarity about what we can't, con what we can control and engagement and then acceptance after we grieve the pieces we cannot control are very useful for hydrating ourselves through an endurance race where we we don't know the elevation we have ahead of us and we don't know when the end is going to be. That's beautiful. Thank you, Carrie. And I think you're right that this is going to impact people in very different ways. Everybody's unique. It's not there's no one way that you're going to feel about all this. People are going to be all over the map. And I think everyone needs to pay attention to themselves and to, to do these things to take care of themselves. I think that's, uh, there's also a certain amount of, I don't have time. I mean, that was before, that was here before COVID-19. Um, and I don't have time. And the other thing is this global uncertainty given the level of uh, uncertainty, like, can you do anything? You know, are there things you can do because you're a doer? And if no, then let's pay attention to taking a moment to do basic things to recenter. And um, so, you know, we, we want to know, and we don't like not knowing. And we're, you just mentioned beautifully how we know nothing. We know nothing, and there is no clear algorithm. And so one existing algorithm is how can I tend to what's happening around me and within me, inside the skin, outside the skin? Yeah, and we're going to move into some strategies. I think there's just a couple more things I wanted to mention about the impact potentially of, again, of COVID-19. And this is just more just taking a look at some of the things that we might be seeing in terms of the emotional impact. I think what you're saying about trauma Grief. I mean, I think grief is similar to the trauma in the sense that there's no one right right way to have grief. Some people might be, you know, experiencing loss, family members, friends, as well as colleagues, as well as patients right now. And yeah, it's similar in the sense that some people will, you know, have a longer term grief process ahead. Um, there's also, again, the sense of moral injury. And, and I've read a couple of early studies already on moral injury, moral injury specifically related to COVID-19. And I think you hear in the news about how sometimes providers have limited resources and they are forced to make a choice between keeping themselves safe and keeping the work environment safe and providing the highest quality patient care. And these decisions 
at in their best are made by groups, right? That can come together. This should not be an individual's burden. But I think even, you know, do I rush into this room or not? I mean, these are really hard questions that have, I think, a, an emotional consequence for providers. I think too, just seeing these these client, these patients go through this really hard thing, sometimes alone because family members aren't allowed to visit. You know, they're literally FaceTiming people on their deathbed kind of thing. I think it's just really hard to see that and not as able to interact with their patients the way that they normally not, might because they can't be in there. And I think that that's the moral weight of that is hard. And, and there's some some mental health providers are sort of on the lookout for, you know, how's that going to impact people down the road? Yeah. Debbie, I have a friend who is a medical professional who um, is always kind of intrigued about, well, kind of, you know, ask me things when we hang out, like, what do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about this, like feeling emotions and things? And um, and after, you know, we've had these continued conversations and planted these little seeds about the water station. And she called me the other day and said, I just had a thought. Is it possible that when an emotion comes up, you know how I want to kind of shove it down or shove it in a box or just say not useful? Um, what if it's kind of like a physical sensation and I don't get mad at myself for feeling itchy. It's just there. And so I'm kind of yelling on the phone of, ah, yes, yes, that, that is absolutely. So sometimes I am aware that for us, there is this kind of um, easy discourse around moral injury, grief, trauma, and at its most basic you all are probably going to feel lots of emotions and maybe at times and intensities that surprise you and are pretty different than in other areas of your life. And when you had different battery levels or hydration levels and step one, and there's good science to back this up, right? We're not being kind of hokey therapists about this. There's good science that the way you relate to those emotions um, especially it impacts your wellness and health outcomes. Um, so I found that I, I was very grateful to my friend for sharing this kind of um, parallel between the itch and the emotion as they are things that emerge. And if then they arise and you don't need to smack yourself for an itch, right? You can just notice it. So that's a perfect segue. We're going to actually move into part two of this conversation, which is helpful strategies to offer to providers who may be finding that they're struggling emotionally, that they're exhausted, that this has been a really hard thing. So we want to help with your suffering, even though we don't blame you. We're not blaming the victim. We recognize that this is a very difficult circumstances and we want to support you in rehydrating along the way. So stay tuned for part two. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our interns, Dr. Catherine foley Saldania and Dr. Katie Lear. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources of our webpage, offtheclockpsych.com.